official podcast. We are your host. I am TJ Kern. That is Blake Hartsfield. Blake, man, uh, basketball season's over, my friend. Red Raiders yep. lost a tough one to NC State. Uh, we've got a lot to get into. This is a big episode for the basketball program. Um, but first, man, let's let's touch a little bit on that because on our previous podcast, both of us said that we thought Tech and Tech's bracket specifically opened up to give the Red Raiders a chance to make a, uh, a move in, in the tournament. And lo and behold, the team that they matched up with in the first round had to win five games in five days just to get there. Of course, we're, we're talking about America's darlings now, the NC State Wolfpack, who have made it all the way to the final four, Blake. Yeah, TJ, it was an unlucky draw. I was honestly happy with it, as I said on our last podcast. Um, I thought that they were getting a team that was going to have an emotional letdown. Unfortunately, they ran into that team this year, the team that gets hot and uh, goes way further than anybody thought that they were capable of doing. Um, TJ, this the, the bracket did open up. You know, I I don't know if you remember, but I did kind of hit. You called, hint the, at the fact you called the Oakland. I'll give you I, that. I did. I did kind of hint at the fact that Oakland stylistically was going to cause Kentucky some problems. I didn't know if they would win the game, but I thought that it would be close to end up winning the game. And TJ, the the opportunity was there for the Red Raiders. Unfortunately, they ran into a hot team, but but more than just running into a hot team, TJ. Um, and I think NC State was able to heat back up off of the Tech game. They just Tech didn't play a very good game, TJ. If we're if we're being completely honest here, um, as I pull up this box score, you know we shoot thirty eight percent from the field as a whole. They shot fifty one. Um, we shoot we shoot seven of thirty one from three. That's twenty two percent. That's just not good enough, TJ. It's not um, for a team that shot it between thirty five and forty percent uh, for the course of the season to shoot half of that. Um, it's not going to win you games. They, they picked up really bad night to have a bad game. And um, once they got down, it didn't seem like there was a lot of desire to get back in it. And, and I think um, there was a lot of quit in that second half, unfortunately. And, and we've seen that spill over now into the transfer portal, um, which we're about to get into, but it's just a frustrating game. They ran into a hot team and um, tip your path to MC, NC state. We didn't play well. They did. And that's how you end up with an 80 to 67 loss to a team that, um, you were a six and a half point favorite against. So that's that's just the reality of it, man. And uh, I mean, again, health, lack of depth, so many things that we can touch on that, uh, you know, I, I, I've said it on this podcast. I didn't think this was a very deep team and that if something happened to Warren Washington, that this team was going to be hurting come March and DJ Burns and company. And man, I don't know the guy's name, uh, the white guy, but I, I was just like, man, that's their Brock Cunningham. He was, he was getting every loose ball. He was making every play. Um, He's a bigger and, version of Brock Cunningham. And, and really as bad as we played, we were still right there. It seems like every time we get it to five or six points, NC state would go post up old DJ there escalade. And boy, if uh, that wasn't, <laughs> It wasn't fun to watch, but I mean, it, the crowd getting into it. And I mean, look, he, he's got some moves. He, he's got some moves. He's he's a good player, TJ. I'm not going to say he's a great player. Um, and, and maybe this is call it sour grapes, call it a jaded tech fan, whatever you want to call it. The guy gets away with more offensive fouls than anybody I've ever seen in my life and doesn't get called for it because fat guy funny I, I don't know i mean like i i don't get the crowds hooting and hollering and so the refs are just ignoring the fact i mean he's tj multiple he has two things that he would do to commit offense fouls first one is the old shaquille o'neal i'm just gonna lower my shoulder and plow through the guy and create space the nba literally changed the rules to prevent Shaq from doing that that's an offensive foul you can't put your shoulder in the guy's chest and blow him back five feet and then the one that he's sneakily really good at and this is a credit to him because he gets away with it is He's a master of the chicken wing, you know, the the hook where you, you you pin the defender and then you come and he shoots it off his left shoulder. And it's an offensive foul in the book, but he, you know, he doesn't get called for it because he's crafty in how he does it. That's that's a credit to him. But it was it was definitely frustrating. I, I remember sitting there watching that game, yelling at my television as I recovered from knee surgery, going, that's an offensive foul, freaking call it. And it never got called once. Yeah, we can we can turn the page on that here on the nation's official podcast. Put it in the books as they are uh, all the way into the final four. Which, credit to them. To, to our credit, 
a little bit here. Both of us had Tech in the Elite Eight, so we, we did, did have him losing to Houston. Uh, I do want to mention the the really uh, bad injury there to Jamal Shedd. Uh, that 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 really uh, was a tough one to watch because uh, I was pulling for the conference. Well, so I, uh, look, I, 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 I was pulling get there. I was also pulling for the conference. You know, I pull for this conference outside of the University of Texas. Um, so the, obviously, Houston is not them. Um, I actually am happy. After Houston went down with their injury to Duke, I was actually really happy NC State beat them because no one likes Duke. They're, they're kind of like Texas in a lot of ways, only on a national level when it comes to basketball. And if they would have made the Final Four, TJ, they would have gotten to beat a 13 seed, a 12 seed in uh, JMU that upset Wisconsin. Then they would have gotten to beat a Houston team that had four injuries coming in and then lost Shed, where they won by two, a game that Houston wins at full strength or even with just Shed, and then a beat an 11 seed in the Elite. Like it would have just been one of those ridiculous Duke never has to play anybody and gets to the Final Four. So I'm, I'm really happy for NC State. Frustrated we lost to them, but happy they beat Duke. Yeah. And so let's, uh, let's turn the page as uh, we, we get things going here after the tourney. Uh, it is a it is portal season, Blake. As uh, we've come to know, uh, being Red Raider fans over the last few years, covering this team, that uh, panic, man. Well, there's some panic. I'm going to get to that, but man, uh, college basketball has turned into free agency season. Yeah. The portal has opened up everything, uh, recruiting, and tech has taken advantage of this transfer portal. We've talked about it a bunch here on our podcast. For those that uh, have listened to us before, and Blake, the biggest name that we have to start with is Pop Isaacs going to the transfer portal. Are we starting there and not talking about the two guys that graduated? Well, okay, I'll let you handle that. Well, so obviously, there's there's going to be a lot of turnover. I'm sure most Tech fans that are watching this podcast have uh, are are not living under rocks, and they they're aware of uh, all of the entrance into the portal, and we're going to get into those individually, but. Before we do, you know, we do lose two seniors to, to graduation. Uh, Warren Washington graduates and Joe Tuasson graduates. Both starters for you that need to be replaced. Um, nothing you could have done to keep them. Um, but then to TJ's point, um, Pop Isaacs. TJ, this this is the controversial one. People are not happy that, that Pop Isaacs is leaving. Um, I think it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and... I don't know that it was um, necessarily because Pop Isaacs wanted to leave, TJ. I, I think Grant McCaslin, from what I have heard, more or less let Pop have it a little bit in their exit interview after the tournament. Um, I think he told him that he didn't think he was a good leader, both on and off the floor. Um, I think McCaslin, despite sticking with Pop for all the off-the-court stuff going back to December when they were in the Bahamas, um, I think that that whole situation frustrated McCaslin. It was a distraction that he didn't want or need to have to deal with. But to McCaslin's credit, he did stick his neck out for Pop, right, and, and went to bat for him. Um, and then TJ, look, I know that it came out after the season that he played the last couple of weeks with a torn labrum, but um, Pop can be an electric player. I'm not taking anything away from him. When he gets going, he can he can fill it up because he is a volume shooter. But TJ, he's one of the most inefficient players in the country. He shot 481 field goals this year. That was second only to uh, Cryer from Houston, who took 487. Um, and Cryer played four additional games that Pop didn't play. So he's a high-volume shooter. He's not an efficient guy. He's not a great defender. Um, and apparently McCaslin kind of let him have it. And I think more or less told him. Um, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, I think that's the good way to put it. So, so I mean, yeah, I mean, Red Raider Nation is up in arms, and we're gonna, I mean, we're we're gonna get into everybody, um, but but with Pop, uh, I mean, he is the polarizing figure. He is he was the leading scorer in a big in, in a Big Twelve when you were five and one, and in first place in the conference. Look, a lot of us like Pop. I like I Pop. I, I don't I don't dislike Pop. I I'm and I'm probably I get frustrated with him. I'm I'm probably gonna ruffle some feathers when I say this. You can upgrade from Pop Isaacs. 100%. I'm not. Mad, I'm not mad that Pop Isaacs is in the portal. That's not no. saying that he's not a great player. He he's not a good shooter. Whatever. I, I think that is a position where if you want to play at the level that Grant McCaslin wants to play at in the Big Twelve, playing for Big Twelve championships, playing for national championships, I think that is a starting position that you can absolutely upgrade from. 
I, I couldn't have said it any better, TJ. I think Pop is a, I, I don't dislike Pop. I like Pop. I get frustrated as hell at times with Pop with the inefficiency. You know, we talked on this podcast. He was in a, he went in a two and a half week slump where he like five or six games in a row and he was like one of 13 from the floor or one, two of 10 from the floor. He's, he shoots and shoots and shoots. He, he, he reminds me a lot of Tim Hardaway Jr. for the Mavericks, where he can shoot you right into or right out of a game, right? And um, those that are Mavericks fans, me included, get real frustrated with Tim Hardaway Jr. because it's like he's the black hole of the offense, where if he touches the ball, oh, it's oh, going up. If he up. touches the ball, it's going it's up. Going, yeah, it's going up, right? Pop isn't quite that bad, but it's close, right? Especially if he gets it. it a lot of if he doesn't if he initiated the offense he would obviously give it up to start a set but once he got past the ball in a set he very rarely gave it up it was usually going up right and um, I agree with you I think you can upgrade I think he's a good scorer but he's inefficient I would rather have a guy that makes better decisions takes better shots at times um, there was a lot of times this year where Pop would jack up a bad three with 15 or 16 seconds left on the shot clock and you'd see McCaslin over there kind of do this and just get front like it I, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I know that's going to sound controversial. Like you said, it doesn't surprise me that McCaslin kind of told him thanks, but no thanks. And before we, I wanted to start with pop, right? Because pop is the one that's got Twitter all up in a blaze, but let's, let's go back and take a step back and look at this core. Look at who is still on this team because with one year of eligibility remaining, you still have Kerwin Walton who proved to be a, uh, efficient big 12 fantastic. Uh, commodity yeah he was fantastic this year you know um was a, a sniper um of all snipers um uh, from three my guy chance mcmillan has one year left of eligibility another guy who i think you can just throw right into the starting lineup um and he can take another step forward next year for you but blake I like him as a six. I, I like him as a six. At the beginning I, I like, of the year, you said that this was your guy, and this program is going to be led by Darion Williams. Yeah, Darion. I mean, and I think McCaslin basically told Darion he's building around him. He's the guy next year. Um, to your point about Chance, I, I love Chance as well. Like you, he is your guy. Um, I could see him going into the starting lineup, but TJ, I kind of like him as a six man. I, I really like him in that off the bench where he plays starter minutes. Cause he averaged 30 minutes a game this year. Um, I really like his offense. It's just instant scoring off the bench. And I think the long-term plan here, TJ is ideally if McCassin gets his way is that your first two guys up off the bench this year for the guard and wing position are going to be chance McMillan and Kerwin Walton. They're both going to play significant minutes, but I think he wants to upgrade across the board um, with the starters. And if you could have those two guys coming in as, as offense that can knock down shots, Kerwin's a pure spot up shooter uh, chance can kind of create his own shot a little bit more. Um, but I love both of those guys coming off your bench as instant offense and both getting 25 plus minutes a game. Um, and then the only other guy, the only other guy left on the roster is Emelia Hollow, uh, who okay. showed some things at the end of the year. I think ideally he's going to be the fourth, third or fourth big in rotation next year. Um, you know, maybe your first big up, depending on how many quality ones they get in the portal, but they got to get at least two. Um, and, and that's all that's left. And we're about to get into the other ones that have left and why they left. Right. So now we're going back to the portal. Okay. Um, and I am very surprised I don't know about you at people that are up in arms saying what's going on with this program, right? Like it, it's the old Bill Parcells a, a analogy, right? If you're going to let me uh, cook the dinner, at least let me go get the groceries. Yeah. And that's what, exactly. that's what coach McCaslin sits right now. Um, and Look, the he, he deserves bring it. Up as a guy who played very well and i think he is a very serviceable role player in the big 12 but it's another position of uh opportunity to upgrade we're going to start with this de soto's robert jennings yeah i thought robert jennings um did a nice job uh he was playing out of position he's not a five he was asked to play the five on this team he's a four um TJ, I, th I think McCaslin had a relationship with Jennings and his family beforehand coming into the year, which is part of why he was able to get him out of the portal to come back to tech. Um, but I think this was a mutual parting of ways. I, I think McCaslin in the, if I were reading the tea leaves here, because Jennings got a lot of run, right? And there's an obviously an opportunity at the four and the five position next year based on what's in the 
what's on the roster returning. Now we don't know what they're going to get in the portal, but I think probably what happened here, TJ is in their exit interviews is McCaslin was probably just very honest with, with Robert and said, look, we plan to sign three or four bigs. Um, depending on who we sign, I, I don't have a guaranteed role for you here. Um, there would be no hard feelings if you wanted to go look at opportunities outside of tech. And that's kind of the nice way of processing a guy out of the program, right? Is, is saying it's, there's going to be no hard feelings, but I think that's kind of what happened. Yeah. And then the, the next guy I think um, that's on the list here is no surprise at all. Um, a guy that barely got any run, um, Kyron Lindsay. TJ, he got kicked off the team. He didn't even travel to West Virginia. He wasn't on the bench in any game after that. He didn't go to the Big 12 tournament. Um, this should shock no one. McCaslin more or less kicked him off the team in the middle of the season because he doesn't. He had one good game, but I guess he doesn't apply himself in practice. I don't think he's a very good teammate. I don't think he has a very good attitude. Um, and one thing McCaslin, I think, has made clear is he wants guys that love basketball, that love their craft. And if you're just here looking for a bag, Texas Tech isn't the place for you. So... Yeah, and then here's another guy that I love. Great role player, great teammate, um, but I I think it's a an opportunity to upgrade a scholarship. Lamar Washington. Are you losing anything? I mean, he's a he's a plus defender, I guess. He he gives you nothing on the offensive end. Um, he didn't get a ton of run this year as a, as a player. Once we got into conference season, the the bench shortened a little bit. I don't think McCaslin trusted him much, and. Um, TJ, I just I don't think he has the offensive game to play at the Big Twelve level, um, so I think he he'll he'll end up somewhere in the in the you know probably in the Mountain West, uh, maybe back home at UNLV, um, but yeah, that's I I don't think that's a big loss. And then well, here's a name that uh, doesn't even need a, a sentence said, but Drew Steffi is in the portal. Bye. <laughs> I mean, like bye. <laughs> yeah. Damarian Williams. Not a shock. I mean, he didn't even play this year. Um, not a, I don't think he's a Big 12 player. I think Mark Adams um, checked out a little bit that second year after his first year Sweet 16 run. That was a disaster transfer portal. That was the Fardaz Amok, uh, Damarian Williams class, and and nobody from that class could play. So, um, it's, and, and this is, not this a is the guy that last night I think really had Twitter in an uproar, tech Twitter, and they were like, man, what's going on over there? Coach McCaslin and the crew. Devin Cambridge. Yeah, TJ, this one surprised me too because everything that I had been told from um, folks that would know um, that are very connected to the basketball program was that the plan coming into this offseason was to build around Darion Williams first and foremost, and then he wanted Chance McMillan, Kerwin Walton, Amali Yahalo, and then Devin Cambridge was penciled in as a starter again next year coming back from injury. This this program and McCaslin stood by him after his injury. He continued to, to get his NIL money to basically just rehab. They helped him rehab. Um, they told him that he had a role and a place as a starter coming into next year. They wanted him back. Um, what and and it it rightfully that kind of leaked out that that was what the plan was. And then it right you know people were right to be shocked last night i was surprised um I've, I've since done a little bit of research and talked to some folks that that would that kind of got the scoop on what happened here and um it sounds like he asked for just a ridiculous bag um to stay and mccaslin's not gonna do that um apparently he wanted to be paid more than darion um i don't know that that's true that's just one of the things that i've seen um it, it was not a, a number. What I do know is that it was whatever number was asked was not a number tech was willing to meet. Um, and again, I, I said it a couple of minutes ago, but I think it speaks to to what McCaslin's trying to build here. And, and look, TJ, he had a great first year. He came in late. He got the, the class together. He finishes fourth in the Big 12. He has now earned the right to be able to shape and mold this team in his own image and get the kind of guys in here that he wants. And he, the guys that he wants are the Darion Williamses of the world. The, the Chance McMillans of the world. Kerwin Walton wasn't a guy that he recruited, but I think Kerwin Walton busted his butt when he got an opportunity, and I think McCaslin likes that. Um, TJ, he wants guys that love basketball, that are here to win, that want to get better and improve, want to be coached. Um, yes, he understands NIL is part of it, and Tech has a very competitive top three or four in the Big 12 NIL program. 
But if you're just coming here looking for the biggest bag, McCaslin's going to look at you and say, this isn't the program for you. And I like that. I mean, I'm, I'm all for these kids getting paid and, and, and the NIL program I think is, is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And I think tech is more than competitive on that front, but I don't just want a bunch of guys that are chasing a bag. Um, I'd rather have guys that love basketball and want to win while also getting the, getting a little bit of money on the side for it. Yeah, there's no doubt about that here on the nation's official podcast with TJ and Blake and Blake. I mean, as we look to re uh, redoing this roster in the off season for coach McCaslin, not, again, nothing new for red Raider fans. Uh, you know, we went portal in last year and they signed five guys, all five guys had played in the NCAA tournament. I expect that to be a, a, another big thing for coach McCaslin this off season. But this time you have eight to nine spots where you can really go get some size, some athleticism and some playmaking at the guard position. TJ hit the nail on the head on the first two. I think McCaslin wants really three or four things in the guys that he's targeting. He he wants to get bigger. I think he realizes that we weren't we were too small this year and it it showed its ugly head in the NC State game. You just weren't big enough to compete with that team. I think he wants to be more physical. You look at his teams at North Texas, they were physical, scrappy, gritty defensive teams um, that were efficient on the offensive end, which brings me to the last thing he wants is he wants guys that are efficient which is why you saw the Pop Isaacs transition, right? Is he wants guys that that run a good system, take good shots and make shots at a high clip and, and, and are efficient basketball players. So athleticism, uh, physicality, um, guys that have the, the right makeup, if you want to call it that, that love basketball to talk about and good shooters. Uh, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of the shooters. Just check out Kerwin and Chance. Those, you know, I, I love, I love the shooters. Love, love the guard play, but uh, you got to be able. To, uh, and as much as we love Joe Toussaint for what he did and his effort on defense, his inability to get his own shot at times um, was kind of what led Pop to just taking random crazy shots. Yeah, I mean, Toussaint is uh, he can knock down the three. He's not a consistent shooter from out there, but he is a guy that needed to get put his head down and get to the rim. And at six foot, sometimes that can be difficult as a small guard, right? Um, and if you start looking at the list of, of, of guys that they've reached out to and a couple of the guys that they're bringing in for visits, TJ, they want to get bigger. They want bigger guards. Um, I don't know that it's going to be as, as physical and big as we saw in Mark Adams' first year where we had five guys six six or bigger starting. Um, where they switched everything. I, I don't know if it's going to be that drastic of a shift, um, but he wants to get bigger. He wants to get more athletic. He wants to be better defensively, and he wants to keep the offense. Look, TJ, the, to your point, th this offense this year is better than anything we've had in any of this run for basketball in the last seven, eight years now uh, under Beard Adams or whoever, um, Tubby Smith. Like This offense was, was a breath of fresh air, um, and at times this team struggled to get stops, and I think McCaslin wants to shore up that end of the floor. No doubt about it. And make sure you guys like, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff you see at the bottom of the screen. And check out scarletandblackinsider.com. That is the new forum brought to you by the nation. We've got some great personalities over there for all the new uh, names and rumors and all that good stuff. Check that out, scarletandblackinsider.com. You can keep up with the Portal Watch just like the rest of us are going to do. Uh, Blake, I know you had a, a name that uh, you wanted to talk about. Well, there's two guys, TJ. And, and again, this is this is straight out of Scarlet and Black Insider. If you're not a subscriber yet, um, get over there and subscribe. Austin and, and RC and Jacob do a great job of, of getting insights. They're very well connected. Um, you know, there, there's two guys, TJ. One that's on campus right now, um, and it's uh, Brendan Wenzel. He's a 6'7 guard from wyoming um now wyoming's in the mountain west which is a you know fairly good basketball league they put six teams in the tournament um you go look at his games against the tournament teams and he was consistently putting up 20 points against them but for the season uh he averaged you know 12 points five and a half rebounds uh you know and uh, two assists um he's got one year of eligibility remaining so he's an older player high iq guy um he's a great three point, shooter three point do what three point eight thirty eight percent so he's a good yeah, shooter that's my guy. Um, high basketball IQ, understands spacing, how to use screens to get open. Um, 
and like I said, a six seven guard. So that there's some improvement. And then the but guy that's TJ what that blows me away, right? A six seven guard who can play in the backcourt, whereas you had six seven Robert Jennings playing the five. Yes, absolutely. So if if that doesn't commit to the ability, the, the commitment that McCaslin has to getting longer and more athletic while also keeping shooting. The guy that I want more than anybody right now, TJ, this guy by the name of Kevin Overton. Okay. This is a kid that's scheduled to come visit tech um, after the dead period. So starting on Friday, there's a dead period for the final four uh, from Friday through Monday night. And then it reopens on Tuesday. He will be in Lubbock. Then is what I've been told. Um, TJ, this is a six, five guard. He played at sunrise Christian for uh, Luke Barnwell. Who's now our top assistant after Dave smart took the Pacific job. Um, so there's a relationship there. This will be his third visit. He's already visited Colorado state. Who's after him. Uh, and Oklahoma, where he's from, uh, but Tech does get the last visit. And TJ, I will be surprised if if this young man gets out of Lubbock and there's not a deal inked and he hasn't committed to Tech. Um, he's a freshman this past year, so he's got three years of eligibility remaining. So very similar to Daron Williams, young player, 6'5 guard, 11 points a game, three rebounds a game, uh, two assists, 35% three-point percentage. He's got a good stroke, so I think that could tick up even a little bit more. Um, TJ, this is a guy who can score. Um, he can score from all three levels. Uh, he understands spacing. He can guard. He's a good defender. He can guard the one through the three, um, but he can score from all three levels, uh, from three mid range, and he can get the get to the basket. Um, this is my number one guy that they're in on right now that I want them to sign. Well, you heard it right here on the Nation's official podcast with TJ and Blake. Man, Blake, this is a fun, action-packed episode. A lot going on with Tech basketball. But before we get out of here, there's some breaking news on the football front. Yes, there is, TJ. You're the, you're the news guy. I'll let you break it. Oh, man. Well, it, it, he's your guy, so I kind of feel like I should pass I get credit. I get credit for him and Darion, huh? Yeah. <laughs> he so is anyway, my guy. Greg, I, I've, Greg I've been the leader. Morton, that, that's your guy. Yes. Okay. Has been shut down for the rest of spring ball to rest up his shoulder your yeah. thoughts i think it's i'm not gonna sit here and pretend like it's not a little bit concerning um but at the end of the day i think this is a good thing i think that they're just protecting him letting him they don't want to overexert him or have a relapse to the injury uh mcguire released a statement about 15 20 minutes ago more or less saying as such he's participated to the first half spring ball so you get 15 practices in the spring uh, for those that don't know, and then you get your spring game. Uh, they've done eight practices. They're shutting him down at this point. Um, TJ, he is – we all know how good Barry Morton is. Everybody who's watched this podcast knows how I feel about Barry Morton. Um, I think he is the truth and the answer, but they're shutting him down to protect him. They said he'll be uh, resuming activities in the su- later in the summer when summer ball opens for practice. Um, McGuire all but said that if there was a game today, he'd be our starting quarterback and would be playing, but um, – they're using this as an opportunity to, to see who's going to be the number two quarterback between uh, Jake Strong and, and Will Hammond. And um, boy, I hope Will Hammond wins that job. I, I think that that's the best thing for the program is he's your backup quarterback next year. So, yeah, that Will Hammond uh, uh, highlight tape, man. Ooh, boy, if he's anything like he was at Hutto. Well, and not only that, but. And I hate to put a lot of stock into a couple of a couple of performances from from young Jake Strong, but uh, he struggled a little bit when he was forced into action last year. So, um, you know, it is what it is. So, okay, so you you, you say it's not not a huge deal, a little uh, concerned, but rest. yeah, I'm going to take the other side. I'm I'm a little concerned. Okay, I I I. I this is about, like you said, they, they want to develop some depth in the quarterback room. They want to see what they have. They want to see how good Will Hammond is. And they they want to make sure that uh, Morton's healthy, which, I mean, I'm okay with, whatever. But he's got to have time with, uh, you know, the receivers and the new tight ends. We've got new weapons on campus, right? Like, so, I, I mean, I, I'm a little concerned. Fair. I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not, you know, saying very the, fair. The world, and I'm just, just a little concerned here. It's very fair. Because very fair. Has, we, and we've talked about it on our podcast. Is he bad luck or is he injury prone? And so, I mean, we're, we're still in that debate. So if he sits out all spring and next thing, you know, first game out of the box, boom, now he's hurt again. I mean, 
I don't yeah, know. No, if, if he gets, if he gets hurt, yeah. If if he gets hurt again, there's, it's probably fair to to start asking about the injury prone thing. I do think he's been a little bit of snake bitten. Um, you look at his two injuries, right? When he was a true freshman, when he burst on the scene, um, when I fell in love with him and and started being the conductor of the Baron Morton train. For anybody who didn't know that, um, absolutely. I'm, I've been there since the Oklahoma State start. His first time that he stepped on the field, but. Uh, where he got hurt was that TCU game. I was at the game with my wife, who's who's a TCU grad in Fort Worth, and uh, TCU. That was the year TCU went to the national championship game. Um, it was a little bit of an alligator roll on, on the play that hurt him. I, I'm not saying that it was an intentional, but that was also the year that I think of the 11 games TCU played, like seven of the 11 starting quarterbacks, and not ended up not finishing the game due to injuries. Uh, do with that what you like um but it was a little bit of a gator roll where he rolled over and twisted the knee a little bit and that's what hurt the knee and then last year it was the ac joint where we talked about there was two things working against him one kitley didn't understand that he needed to stop running his damn quarterback like a running back and give the ball to taj brooks hopefully that's been corrected we saw that a little bit at the end of last year and then secondly tj this offensive line hadn't been good enough um they're they're encouraged about that group in the spring they think that the transfers they brought in and then some of the freshmen from two years ago uh, and, and McGuire's first class or will be ready to make an impact. Um, they're expecting that, that group to be significantly better than last year. Um, so if, if you get better protection and Kitley understands that he's a quarterback and that Taj Brooks is the running back and let's treat them as such, um, I think he should be healthy. Well, there you have it from Blake Hartsfield, the conductor of the Baron Morton train. Always. All right. Yeah, Blake. Uh, it's been fun. It's been real. It's been a good one. How do we always get out of here on these? Wreck them. Wreck them. All right. Be sure. ScarletBlackInsider.com. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff on the bottom. We'll talk to you guys next time.